Alvis Croft and Boldwood presents A Year at the French Farmhouse, written by Gillian Harvey and read by Lucy Scott. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. For Mum and Dad, Richard and Barbara. Chapter One don't think of it as a dead end. Try to think of it as an opportunity, Mark said brightly, flashing his perfect porcelain veneers. You'll be given a generous redundancy package, three months' salary, plus an additional lump sum to keep you going. I... what? For a moment, time slowed. Through the slightly grubby window above Mark's head, Lily could see the shadows of cars purring by on the road. The flicker of figures walking purposefully past, muffled snippets of conversation filtered in and out of the basement office as people outside on the pavement moved closer, then further away. The sights and sounds of ordinary life seemed suddenly jarring. In the current climate, it's a generous package, Mark added into the silence. Lily looked at the executive toy on Mark's desk, a silver row of balls that, when tapped, perpetually rocked back and forth. She imagined what would happen if she picked it up and lobbed it through the frosted window, the glass shattering, balls everywhere. Lily, everything all right? said the man, who'd just ripped the rug from under her entire life. Who said it was a dead end? she asked suddenly, the words only just sinking in. He at least had the good sense to blush. I didn't. I mean, of course, he stammered. But this wasn't his fault. The partners had brought Mark's company in to streamline the business and avoid the awkwardness of giving loyal employees the boot. Although it wasn't the boot in the traditional sense, was it? She wasn't being sacked. It wasn't that she'd messed up on a client file or started turning up for work late. She was simply surplus to requirements, and they were trying to survive in a world where every man and his dog thought he could design his own logo. She'd have done the same, probably in their shoes, not that she'd be seen dead in a pair of comfort brogues. She looked again at Mark, with his untroubled, unmarked brow, sharp fitted suit, nails that had probably had a more recent manicure than hers. He couldn't be much more than twenty-five. Employed to deliver bad news, but with no real sense of its impact. She was just another name on his to-do list. She wished she could say that it didn't matter anyway, or that she'd had the chance to quit before they'd fired her, marching purposefully out of the office and leaving the partners wondering if they'd made a mistake. And if only they'd held off till this time next year. She could have. By then... She and Ben would have their house on the market and be packing for a new life in France. They'd been planning for years, but each time they'd tried to fix a date, something had come up. A promotion at work, Ty getting into a new sports club, and so on. Then, a few months ago, they had finally agreed on a definite time. OK, Ben had said. Let's take a year to get Ty settled at uni. Then we'll... Go for it. She'd leapt into his arms laughing and he'd twirled her around as if they were twenty years younger and she was ten kilos lighter. It had been the culmination of a lifelong dream and she'd been looking forward to dramatically handing in her notice next spring. Now even that minor victory had been snatched away. I take it I get to go home now? She asked, turning to face Mark as she reached the office door. Well, it's entirely your decision, he said. There is a one-month notice period, but the partners were keen to stress that if you don't feel able to come in, it won't reflect badly on your exemplary record. He smiled again, delivering yet another pre-rehearsed line. She almost took the bait, but not quite. They knew she was a perfectionist, that she always wanted to do the right thing, but she wasn't going to endure a month of working effectively for nothing when she could be out finding another job. 
or finally cleaning out the kitchen cupboards, or, if it came to it, sitting on the sofa watching reruns of Homes Under the Hammer while working her way through a giant pack of Pringles. Right, well, I'll be off then, she said, trying to keep her voice from wobbling. Mark's eyebrows raised slightly, but he said nothing. She raced into the corridor and up the stairs to the ground floor, then made a beeline for the exit, hoping to escape before she started to cry. But when she was halfway across the main office, her progress was thwarted by the thwack of a door almost opening in her face. Her boss, Graham, stepped out of the toilet, saw her, coloured, and vanished back inside, a lock clicking audibly. "'That's right!' She wanted to yell, you hide, Graham. Don't want to have an awkward conversation. Or, I don't know, thank me for my decade of service. I'll just go quietly, shall I? Inside the bathroom, she heard the sound of a flush. She swallowed her words. Well, she said, turning to the other eight employees and backing towards the reception desk, in no doubt that her face was red from the heat she could feel prickle her skin. I guess this is goodbye. The words sounded dramatic in her head, but in the office on an average Friday afternoon, all she received in return were a few grunts of vague acknowledgement, as if redundancy was infectious and nobody wanted to catch it. Bye, honey, said Karen on reception, looking up with an oblivious smile as she passed. Early finish, eh? Something like that. Well, have fun, honey. Once she was safely inside her car, Lily allowed the tears to fall. They streamed hotly down her cheeks, tears of anger, disappointment, fear for the future, and an inexplicable shame at finding she was surplus to requirements. The shame came as a surprise. Redundancies aren't uncommon, she knew that. Friends, ex-colleagues, strangers on social media, she'd seen it happen frequently. Often people used the opportunity to try something new, or even took it voluntarily to make the most of a fresh start. But nobody had ever mentioned the gut punch you felt when it actually happened. No one had ever said how it felt humiliating and infuriating and so many other atings she couldn't properly find words for. Eventually, she wiped her eyes on her sleeve, something she'd spent the last 18 years training Tyler not to do, and started the car. Switching on the radio, she tried to engage herself with the hot topic of the day on LBC, whether raising a dog was easier or harder than raising a child. At least babies wear nappies, a woman was saying. You don't see mums in the park picking up their kids' poop. But she couldn't focus. Instead, she kept thinking of the meeting, imagining how she could have reacted differently. Turning over chairs or doing a Jerry Maguire loudly vowing to start a new firm and taking one of the better interns with her for the ride. Maybe she should have yanked Graham out of that toilet and forced him to actually explain his reasoning to her, made him look her in the eye and, well, if nothing else, apologise. Because not only had he used to be her boss until about half an hour ago, she'd also thought of him as a friend. He'd looked at pictures of Ty growing up, He'd spoken to her about his family. Come to think of it, she'd even helped him pick out an anniversary present for his wife, Brenda, last month. Her choice of necklace had got him out of the doghouse for last year's gift disaster, a voucher for a nooks and crannies luxury wax at the local beauty salon. She felt the tears well again and shook her head. Nope, she wasn't going to fall apart. She'd been through worse, and it wasn't as if they were going to be in financial difficulty. Ben's job was going well. They had some savings. Ty was off to university soon and even had a part-time job lined up for when he arrived. They would be OK. She would be OK. She began to drive the familiar route home. Cars hummed rhythmically as they passed in the opposite direction, and the larger shops began to morph into smaller stores, newsagents and corner shops as she reached the outskirts of town. Everything was the same, but everything seemed somehow different. She was detaching from her ordinary life, like a greying plaster dropping wetly from a graze. 
At the traffic lights, she caught the eye of the man in front in his rear-view mirror, his eyebrows knitted into a scowl. People passed on the streets as she waited for the green light, their faces intent on smartphones, their expressions distant. A woman with a buggy, laden with so many shopping bags it almost tipped every time she rested, fought her way past. The scenery, while familiar, was grey and man-made and set against a backdrop of miserable sky. Nothing much had changed in the town over the past twenty years. Sure, she had happy memories of living here, working here. She remembered delicious meals in jam-packed restaurants, drinks in bars after work. Good times. Yet stepping back, she saw her working life for what it had been. Endless pounding on a corporate treadmill, reaching for more, working harder, trying all the time to keep up with others in a race that meant nothing. It was definitely time for a change. By the time she pulled into her driveway, she was feeling more determined. She'd sit down with Ben and make a plan. Let's do it, she'd say dramatically. It's only a year early. Let's just take the plunge. Vive la France! She'd been dreaming about cross-channel living for at least a decade before they'd even met. She'd spent summers in Limousin and Dordogne as a child, bumping along in Dad's VW camper van, trundling from campsite to campsite, and had fallen in love with the leisurely pace of life, the fresh air, the views, the culture. One day, she'd said to Ben shortly after they'd got together, let's move to France and have an adventure. If she was honest, she was a little tired of waiting for the move anyway. Every time she'd sat with Ben and discussed it, the goalposts had seemed to move. They'd originally said they'd see Ty through his GCSEs, then his sixth form exams. Now they were waiting to see Ty settled at uni. She'd been on board, for the most part, with Ben's suggestions, but it had still hurt to continually put her dream on the back burner. Last time, to make up for the delay, Ben had bought her a French silk scarf for her birthday, together with a book entitled France, Your Guide to Moving, and a hamper containing brie, camembert, escargot and wine. If Lily can't make it to France just yet, then I'll bring France to her, he'd said, giving her a kiss. It wasn't exactly living the dream, she'd thought, munching snails at the kitchen table in Basildon. But she'd smiled and kissed him, because he'd made the effort, been thoughtful. Plus, the year before, he'd bought her a saucepan set, and she'd never forget the miracle juicer he'd produced for her fortieth that came with a free Slimmer Thighs recipe book. This, at least, had been growth. Now, pulling into the driveway... She sat for a moment and looked at the house that had been theirs for the past fifteen years. It had served them well, had been a great family home, newly built when they'd moved in, small but perfectly formed. Their semi was part of a row of identical houses on an estate that was neatly built and well maintained. The red bricks had faded slightly, but it still had the appearance of something shiny and modern. The double glazing had kept them warm, the garage too small for anything but the tiniest of cars, had provided the ideal space for Ty's drum kit during his rock star wannabe phase. It was practical, it had been a safe choice, but wasn't a patch on the French farmhouse she'd dreamed of living in for so long. Over the years, she'd spent hours scrolling through French property listings on the internet, flicking through French property news, lusting after stone cottages in the corners of tiny hamlets, renovation projects with potential to make your own mark. She drooled over stories of people moving over and living the dream, snapping up properties mortgage-free for a song and making a forever home to be proud of. Don't think of it as a dead end. Try to think of it as an opportunity. The last thing she wanted to do was agree with Mark, whose whole reason for existence was going from firm to firm and trimming the fat, but perhaps, just on this, he'd been right. Feeling her heart rate increase, she stepped out of the car into the spring air. It was only five o'clock, but already there was a touch of early evening chill. 
The sky was a bland wash of grey and white, the sun hidden and glowing weakly beneath layers of cloud. She breathed deeply, trying to steady herself. But she could feel something beginning to take hold. Excitement. A feeling that actually, just possibly, her life was about to change. Ben worked from home on a Friday. He'd be busy at his desk, not expecting her back for an hour or so. She'd wrap her arms around him, tell him the news, then open his eyes to the possibilities that lay before them. I will be fine. We can fly back and forth, and even keep the house in England for now, she'd say. Surely he couldn't say no to that. Perhaps, at last, this was going to be their time. The house was quiet as she let herself in. Ty's coat was missing. He'd be out playing fortnight with friends, or at the gym. She crept upstairs to Ben's office, letting out a small cough before disturbing him. The last thing she wanted to do was shock him into a heart attack just when their lives were opening up. But as she pushed his office door open with a lively preparatory bonjour, she saw that the room was empty. A jumper hung on the back of his swivel chair. His computer screensaver bounced across a black screen. Piles of paperwork were neatly stacked. He'd finished balancing other people's books for the week. Ben, she called, walking down to the kitchen, almost tripping over a trail of laundry that Ty had helpfully flung in approximately the direction of the dirty washing basket. She bent and picked up the errant clothes on autopilot, grimacing as she felt something sticky on her hand. Moments later, she almost tripped over her son's discarded backpack at the top of the stairs and tumbled to an untimely death. By the time she got to the kitchen, she felt less as if she needed an adventure and more as if she needed a full hose down and a valium. Ben! she called again, with slightly more edge to her voice. But a coffee cup next to the kettle was the only sign of life. She pulled her phone out of her pocket and quickly scrolled to his number in her contacts. It rang several times before he picked up. Hello, love, Ben said cheerfully. You on your way home? I'm already here. Where are you? Oh, well, I got most of my stuff done, then Baz asked me for a pub lunch. It's five o'clock. Bloody hell, is it? He was slurring his words slightly. Well, we're in the middle of some pool. You can pop down and join us if you want. It wasn't a real offer. No, it's OK. I just hoped... I suppose I hoped you'd be here, so... Well, I've got something to tell you. I can come home if you want, he said then. Just a minute. Sorry, that was Baz. It's my turn. Do you want me to? Yes, she wanted to say, come home immediately. But instead... No, I'll see you later, she replied. She tried to settle down with a coffee, but found it hard to concentrate. She could hardly wait for the moment when Ben would step through the door and she could surprise him with her news. That they no longer had to live out their days as a middle-aged cliché. Her redundancy money would replace any savings they'd hoped to accrue. Ty was a confident boy. Plus, he'd seemed so much more grown up recently that she doubted he'd need them at all once he moved into halls. The stars had finally aligned. She closed her eyes. In her mind, Ben would be overjoyed, released from his own stressful work and able to embrace something brand new. He'd pick her up in his arms and swung her around as he had before, and they'd get the house on the market as soon as possible. Everything is about to change, she said to herself. Later, she'd look back on those words and wonder... If she'd been able to see the future in all its brilliant, frightening, chaotic and unexpected glory, would she have been excited or completely and utterly terrified? It was hard to know what to do with herself while waiting, so in the end she did what she always did in a crisis, picked up the phone and dialed Emily. Chapter 2 Lily lay back on the bed, staring at the ceiling, phone clamped to her ear. She noticed a hairline crack in the plaster, dust on the lampshade. So, what do you think? she asked. I think, 
said Emily. It sounds amazing. And you reckon Ben will be up for it? You think he might not be because of Ty? Well, yeah. I mean, that was his reason for the delay before, wasn't it? Yes, Lily said, rolling onto her front. But you know what? I think Ty's grown up so much in the last six months. He seems so different. I'm sure Ben's noticed it too. I really don't think he's going to need his parents hanging about. Good point. Emily was silent for a moment. Then, Wow, so you're actually going to be doing it, she said, her voice quieter than usual. Well, yes, said Lily. It looks like I am. I'm going to miss you, you know. Emily said wistfully, miss spending so much time with you. Even the times when I make you pluck that wayward grey hair from the back of my head, even those. Even the times I drag you to aerobics on Thursdays, despite your protestations, Lily joked. Well, I won't miss the aerobics, I'll admit, said Emily. Although if I end up eating myself into a state and having to be winched out of my house by a crane, it'll be 100% your fault for leaving and taking my motivation with you. (laughs) as if that would ever happen. You've got the dogs to drag you around, remember? Oh, yes. Thank God for the dogs. They have absolutely no desire to live in France, as far as I can tell. Oh, but you never know. I reckon Buster would look fabulous in a beret. (laughs) You know what? You could be right. Emily laughed. Seriously, though, now it's actually happening. Wow. I'm happy for you, obviously, but, you know... I actually hate the thought of you not being around. I know, Lily said. But I mean, it's been a long time coming. When did I first talk about moving to France? I was, what, about 14? Younger than that. I remember in year eight, all you wanted to do was help Mademoiselle Francois create a French café for parents' evening. But that was just... I... Oh, Mademoiselle, laissez-moi vous aider. Emily mimicked, let me help you. That does not sound like me, Lily laughed. Admit it, you're France obsessed. I wouldn't say obsessed exactly. Really? So tell me, how many times have you watched A Year in Provence? Emily asked, knowing already that it was Lily's all-time favourite movie. It's called A Good Year, actually. A Year in Provence is the book it's based on. Anyway, you know how I feel about Russell Crowe. Lily was a sucker for the now vintage film, the way living in Provence changes the lead character, Max Skinner, from corporate go-getter to someone more wholly real and attractive. The fact Max Skinner was played by Russell Crowe was just a bonus, but she wasn't going to admit how many times she'd watched it, even to herself. Still, don't catch you watching Gladiator on repeat, or A Beautiful Mind, do we? Emily pressed. OK, you got me. I'm France obsessed, Lily said, feeling herself smile. There was no hiding her truth from Emily. But you know, this isn't just me. Ben's really keen to do it too. Next year at least. It shouldn't be too hard to get him to bring our plans forward a bit. It's amazing what 20 years of wearing someone down will do. Two decades of nagging and finally a result, Lily quipped back, although... He honestly does love the idea. I mean, that hamper for my birthday was really... Emily snorted. If someone bought me a packet of bloody snails for my birthday, I'd turn around and shove them up. It was romantic. Romantic, my ass. They laughed. Seriously, though. Good for you, Lil. I mean, just going for it. It sounds like an amazing idea, and I know you've been a bit worried about Ty, but there does have to be a time, doesn't there, when you say, it's my turn now before it's too late. Too late? Well, what are we now, 42? Lily laughed. 44, I'm afraid. Oh, fuck off, we're not. 42 will do. Anyway, we're 42. You want to go to another country, start a business and recline on a sun lounger or whatever. Swim in the lakes, go to beautiful cafes, learn to speak French like a native. Yes, yes, all of that. Emily continued dismissively. But you know... If you'd left it much longer, it might not have been possible. Hey, I'm not planning on shriveling up any time in the near future. Nobody ever is, replied Emily darkly. But soon you'll be fifty, then sixty. Steady on. I'm not saying you're old. We're the same age, for Pete's sake. 
and I'm practically a fetus. But there is going to be a time when it's too bloody late to do all that, when you won't have the energy to set it all up, to do the difficult bit. I reckon you're doing the right thing. Thank you. There was a moment's silence. So what's the plan? Going over and seeing where the wind blows? Arranging some viewings? Renting for a bit? Emily asked. I haven't fully thought it out. Lily opened her laptop, which lay next to her on the duvet, and, putting Emily on speakerphone, brought up a list of French country houses on Google. I mean, France is enormous, and I haven't been that often when it comes down to it, except all those holidays when I was a kid. Ben, well, we've done Nice and Paris a few times, but it's not as if we'll ever afford a house in either of those places. Not unless there's a Euro Millions win you haven't yet told me about. Afraid not. Anyway, city breaks are great for holidays, but living, I want somewhere... Cheaper? Yes, definitely cheaper, she laughed, but also quieter. Somewhere, you know, tranquil. Oui, like Limousin. Where even is that, by the way? It's kind of two-thirds of the way down France, if you look at a map. You know, I went there every year from the age of about twelve to sixteen. Oh, yes. All those postcards with cows on the front. That's the one. Wow. So really rural, then. Yes, but it's beautiful. And the houses are... Well... Lily gasped as a page she clicked on loaded. Wow. Ridiculously cheap. There's an old farmhouse here for 50,000 euros. What's that in real money? Maybe 40 grand? It's within the realms of possibility. I've still got most of my inheritance from mum. And now the redundancy money. Plus, when we sell this place, we'll have money in the bank. To live off for a bit, do the renovations, that kind of thing. We'd have no obligations, time to set up a business. She trailed off, lost in her imagination. Sounds blissful. And it isn't as if I have anything much to stay here for since, well, since Mum died, and with David in Australia now. Excuse me? Nothing to keep you here? Your big brother may not be on the same continent any more, but you still have an errant bestie, Emily said with mock offence. The errant bestie has a passport. Good point. I forgot about the free holiday for the best friends aspect. Forget I said anything. I mean, Ben will see how much it makes sense to get on with it, don't you think? Lily said, trying to still a sudden doubt. Strolling in vineyards, exploring the countryside, collecting fresh bread from the boulangerie every morning. What's the alternative? Sitting in Basildon, watching reruns of Bargain Hunt or Real Deal. Don't knock it till you've tried it. I think Dickinson's growing on me. Are you sure? It's probably just a rogue mole. Ha! <laughs> well, look, you have my 100% support, however you decide to do it. Thank you, Lily said pulling up a page of short-term rentals. There's loads of places to rent, too, while we house-hunt. It'll give Ben a chance to get used to rural living. You know, so it grows on him. Grows on him? You make it sound like a fungal infection. Emily, I'm serious. Well, I'm all for you finally embracing your dreams. You know that. It's about time you stood up for yourself, Lily Butterworth. You are entitled to ask for what you want. Put yourself first. Yes, Lily said. You know what? I think you're right. By the time Ben arrived home several hours later, Lily was sitting on the sofa, flicking through the channels in a vain attempt to find something to watch on TV. Ty had appeared briefly in the doorway at 10.30pm, then disappeared upstairs with a box of Frosties. All right, love, Ben said, walking up and planting a kiss on the top of her head. Yeah, not too bad, she said head full of France and countryside and endless summers. So work gave you the afternoon off or something? What? You were home early, so I thought. Shit. In all her chatting with Emily, paired with three quarters of a bottle of wine, she'd actually forgotten she'd been made redundant earlier that day. Oh, yes. Shit. Well, yeah, I suppose it wasn't such a great day. I mean, not initially. I was made redundant. You're not serious. She'd seen Ben grow pale before, 
Once, when he was at the business end of things when Ty was born, another time when he'd come down with a bad dose of flu. But she'd never seen the colour drain so fast from his skin after such a mild stimulus. He sank on the sofa next to her. His light brown hair, which was, she noticed, desperately in need of a cut, flopping against his forehead as if it, too, was disappointed. Yep, apparently I'm surplus to requirements, she said, shrugging. Oh, my God. Yep, my thoughts exactly. Well, don't panic, he said, gripping her hand more tightly than was comfortable. Actually, I'm not panicking. I wanted to... We'll be okay, he continued, not making eye contact. My salary will cover the mortgage and most of the bills, and we've got a bit saved. And there's your inheritance. Only in an absolute emergency, obviously. Yes, but, Ben, don't you see? This could be our chance, she said, turning to him, fizzing with excitement. We could use the money to do something. I thought, you know, we're moving to France next year anyway, why not just do it now? There's nothing stopping us. He looked at her, and she saw his eyes widen, not with excitement, but something else, something unreadable. He reached up and pushed the wayward strand of fringe away from his forehead. Oh, I don't know, he said. I mean, we were going to get the place spruced up, weren't we, before we sold? The bathroom needs doing and... I don't care about changing the bloody cistern. This would be changing our lives, Ben. He took her hand. I just want to wait till the time is right. But can't you see the time is right? What about Ty? She nodded feeling a familiar flash of guilt. I've thought about him a lot, of course I have, she said, but honestly, it's not like we'll be that far away. We can even keep the house here for a bit. I'll have the redundancy money, a bit of mum's, the inheritance. We could... Something in his expression made her stop. It's just... he said. She looked at him, sitting in his crumpled T-shirt, hair in disarray, worn out from a week of work and too many pints at the pub, imagining him instead in France, sipping coffee on a terrace, no real boss to answer to, imagined the kind of life they could have together, rather than the existence they had now. But his face was sombre and thoughtful, rather than excited. I'm not saying no, he said carefully. It just feels, well, too soon. Too soon? She felt her eyes fill with tears. But we agreed. We waited for Ty's GCSEs, then A-levels, for your work to pick up, all those things. Now we're meant to be waiting for Ty to get through his first year at uni. But I've realised there's always going to be something, isn't there? Even next year there'll probably be something. Well, if there is, we'll wait. There's no point rushing. Are you serious? She asked her stomach flipping over as if she'd just eaten another bowl of snails. What? Well, she said carefully, you promised. We decided, didn't we, that we'd definitely do it next year. I wouldn't say promised. I suppose I promised to think about it, but if things aren't right... Oh, my God! But his expression was firm. Probably better to talk about it in the morning when you're not so emotional, he said standing up and reaching for her hand. Emotional? Yes, I mean, it's very... I can understand it, but you're thinking with your heart, Lily, not your head. It's just too soon. Say it, her mind urged, either come with me or I'm going on my own. Or, if you loved me, you'd come. Something. Oh, she said instead looking at her hands and feeling a tear touch her cheek. Well, look, how about this? She added, almost desperately. Take a month off work. A month? Yes, just listen, she said, putting a hand on his leg. Come to France with me. We'll rent a house in a great location and try it out. It'll be a holiday at worst. At best, maybe the start of something really exciting. He was silent. Can I think about it? A month is a long time. Maybe we could do something shorter. Maybe a hotel or... 
She felt something inside her sink. Okay, she said. It was clearly pointless arguing with him. She felt some of the tears she'd held back start to sting her eyes, but blinked them away. Are you mad with me? he asked in the silence that followed. The man knew her too well. I'm not mad, she said carefully. I'm just... She paused. Ben, tell me honestly, all those plans we made, all those conversations about next year, is it really a case of right timing, or is it that... She paused again. Ben, are you ever going to want to come to France with me? He was silent for a minute. Yes, he said. No, I mean, well, probably, almost definitely. That sounds horribly like a no. It's, well, I suppose, if I'm honest, sometimes I wonder whether it isn't better to let a dream stay a dream. Careful what you wish for and all that. We have our whole lives here, he said, shrugging, his palms upturned in a gesture of surrender. But, look, let's get to bed, he said, putting out his hand for hers again. I'm knackered. I've had too many Guinnesses. I'm pretty sure you've had a few more wines than you usually would. It's hard to think straight. I am thinking straight. Well, maybe I need to uh, sleep on it, you know? OK, she said, not meeting his eye. OK? Yes, we'll talk tomorrow. You go on. I'll be up in just a minute. The minute Ben was out of sight, she opened up her laptop and touched the mouse pad. The screen lit up and she was relieved to find that she hadn't closed down her earlier searches because it ended here. She wasn't going to be someone whom things happened to. She was going to be someone who made things happen. Before she could change her mind, she clicked Select on one of the luxury Jeet rentals she'd been looking at and committed to, if not to a lifetime of indulging her francophilia, then at least a month trying it on for size. Ben would probably come, and if he didn't, it wasn't the end of the world. After all, it would only be a month apart, and a step towards the life she'd always dreamed of. Hopefully, if nothing else, it would show Ben just how serious she was. Anyway, what's the worst that could happen, she thought, as she closed the laptop and went upstairs to bed. Chapter 3 She gradually became conscious, her head heavy on the pillow, her eyes still firmly closed, feeling a pounding in her temples. It had been a while since she'd gone past her self-imposed two-glass limit, and she'd started to forget why she'd set the limit in the first place. Yesterday, when she'd been knocking back the red and waiting for Ben to come home, she'd imagined they'd be leaping out of bed to make new plans this morning— now she'd be lucky if she could stagger to the kitchen for a coffee without incident. As the daylight poked its way through the gap in the curtains and flooded her skin with unwelcome light, she felt an additional throb. Oh, God, she moaned, turning over and covering her face with her hands. There was a reciprocal groan by her side. Oh, Christ, she heard Ben say. Hangover, hangover. He half sat up, propped on his elbows, eyes screwed up against the light. Bloody bass, always tempting me with one last pint. You could say no, you know. That's a very good point. How many did you have? I sort of lost count, I think. Anyway, you're a fine one to talk, Miss Polished off a whole bottle by herself. Was it a whole bottle? She asked, horrified. All on my own? Well, almost. Bloody hell, no wonder I feel like shit. She tried opening one of her eyes, glimpsed the soft flesh of Ben's belly next to her, then closed it again. He laughed and shuffled up in bed. Come on, we'll get through it, together. You're only young once, carpe diem, sees the day and all that. She heard him breathe heavily on his palm. Christ, sorry about my breath. I smell like I've licked the inside of a bin or something. She smiled in spite of the pain. They'd been together over twenty years and still managed to make each other laugh. 
That had to be worth something. Then a snippet of memory returned, and she was retrospectively flooded with annoyance. Young, though? Ben, we haven't been young since 2011. We're running out of days to seize. He laughed briefly, then realised she was serious. Oh, Lily, I know. I can understand why you feel this way, but, you know, we'll find a way through all this. All this? Well, redundancy and... and deciding what to do next. She sighed. But we have decided what to do next. We've talked and talked about it. All I want is to bring it forward by a year. I mean, why wait? And now it seems like, well, it's never going to happen. He was silent. Ben? Look, he said, maybe we should... Well, just put the conversation, the decision on ice for a bit. I just... I shouldn't have been so quick to promise. But Ben... Before she could finish, a memory flashed into her mind, the way they do sometimes the morning after a big night. But this wasn't a memory of dancing on tables or kissing a stranger or doing any of the things often associated with regretful post-binge flashbacks. This was a memory of pressing buy now on a property site. Had she really booked a break in France for herself? The memory was vague, hard to pin down. She couldn't remember any details, location, price. Perhaps she'd meant to, but hadn't seen it through. Either way, she had to check. What? he said. Look, we need to talk about this, she said sitting up, swinging her legs over the side of the bed and trying to sound more upbeat. But let's get some tea first, yes? She looked at her husband, crumpled in the bed, clearly feeling sick, and felt a surge of guilt. Sure, he'd poo-pooed the idea of a month away, but she'd sprung the idea on him last thing at night. He'd have probably at least agreed to the holiday plan if she'd waited until this morning. They could have worked out convenient dates... Then once he was there, something inside told her that he'd fall for France as much as she had. But going behind his back wasn't the right way to do it. She imagined how she'd feel if he'd done the same. It had all seemed so simple last night, so bloody obvious. But that was what the lethal cocktail of best friend and red wine did. Gave the illusion of ease, when actually even going on holiday could be complicated but perhaps she was worrying about nothing. Best to see what she'd actually done before panicking about it. Are you sure you don't want me to get it? He said, once she reached the door, in a voice that was suddenly croaky and weak. Ordinarily, she might have called his bluff and taken his non-offer at face value. But today her laptop was calling. What would you do if I took you up on that reluctant offer? She said instead. I'd probably cry, but I'd do it. I just hope you'd take pity on me, he said, his eyes playfully puppy-like. She shook her head. Idiot, she said, with a small smile, then turned and walked her reluctant legs towards the stairs and towards the laptop that held the answers she was looking for. She reached the downstairs hallway and headed for the kitchen to get the kettle on. Ty had obviously been up for a midnight snack, the cereal cupboard was open, and another newly opened box of Frosties had been knocked on its side. By the sink, there was a bowl with traces of cereal and a small pool of milk. Lily picked up the errant box, put it back in the cupboard, then walked to her laptop, left casually on the kitchen table, and opened it up. She had a sudden flash of self-awareness, seeing herself in the kitchen as if from outside. There she was, tidying up after someone who didn't give her a moment's thought. How many times had she had the close the cereal cupboard and wash your bowl conversation with her son? At least once a week for the past eight years. Probably twice. So, about 800 times. 800 times she'd explained to her boy that now he was old enough to clear up his own mess, the buck stopped with him. And to have a little respect and that cereal cupboards were a magnet for ants and flies if left open. It wasn't such a terrible thing, having to wash someone else's cereal bowl. Some of her friends had three children, even four, and came down to sinks heaving with discarded crockery. 
It was just the thought of all those minutes of her life, probably at least 4,000, she thought, doing the maths, completely wasted. She might as well have kept Stumm and let him scatter Frosties in his wake wherever he went. Outside, the early morning brightness had given way to a shower of rain. Water began to hit the window, and, as she looked out at the view over the back terrace, with its plastic chairs and a pile of single-use barbecues left over from last summer, she was struck by the contrast between the view she'd absorbed every day for twenty years while doing the washing up, and the view she could have displayed on her now open laptop. She tried to click on the picture to see further details, but realised the screen had frozen. She shut the laptop down and rebooted it, hoping she'd be able to retrace her steps and find out what she'd booked and where and for when. As her system came back to life, an email pinged. Of course, she'd have a confirmation email of some kind. OK, Lily, she said to herself. Let's see what we've got ourselves into. Her inbox contained the usual offers of 10% discount, strangely worded spam and confirmation that a pair of tights she'd ordered two weeks ago had left the warehouse. Constant updates meant she knew more about the whereabouts of her hosiery than her son most days. And then another email. From eBay. She'd known she'd looked at holiday properties on the auction site, but had no idea that she'd booked a place through there. It had just been one of a number of pages she'd had open at the time. The title of the email was half obscured. Congratulations, it enthused. You placed the winning bid for... She clicked on the email, eager to find what she'd let herself in for, and crucially, for how much. As she read the text, she let out a little involuntary yelp. Everything all right, love? Ben called from upstairs. Yes, she lied. Fine, just burn my fingers. I'm fine. She closed her eyes for a minute, just trying to breathe and work out what on earth she should do. She had no idea. She walked to the counter and poured hot water into their two mugs, feeling herself break out in a sweat. Was this even binding? Could doing something like this really be as simple as a click? She desperately tried to calculate how much money they had in their savings. On their credit card, with her redundancy money factored in, would that even cover it? She shut the laptop as if shutting it away might actually delete the terrible mess she'd managed to get herself into, picked up the finished teas and made her way upstairs. There was no way she could let on to Ben, not until she knew what she was going to do. When she reached the bedroom, Ben was sitting half-propped against the headboard. He'd thoughtfully arranged her pillows in an upright position so she could comfortably sip her tea in bed, proving that although he wasn't the most adventurous husband, he did actually care. As she approached, she saw his face furrow with concern. You sure you're okay? he said. You look really pale. Pale? she said, trying to sound normal. I'm fine. She grinned widely to prove it. You sure? he said. Your smile looks... weird. You don't think you're going to be sick or anything? No, it's nothing... She lied, passing him his mug and sitting back on the bed. No need to call the cavalry, I'm sure I'll survive. He looked at her doubtfully. Okay, as long as you're sure. She sipped her tea. Yeah, it's just this hangover. Can't remember the last time I had one. Think yourself lucky. Oh yes, she said. That's what gives you a hangover. Bad luck. (laughs) Okay, well, I like to think so, he said. Bad luck and Baz. Never your own fault? (laughs) Never my own fault. He grinned and reached for her spare hand. Look, I was thinking, he said, about, you know, what you said about France. She felt something inside her lift. You were? She looked at his face, and instead of the reluctance and fear she'd seen last night, she saw an openness as if he, too, was beginning to feel excited about her suggestion. Despite the dark circles under his eyes, his tousled hair and the faint smell of alcohol on his breath, he looked better than he had for a while, alive with an idea. 
Yes, and look, I'm sorry. Perhaps I should have taken things a bit more seriously. I know how much you love France, and I suppose I do owe you, after sort of, I don't know, promising things. He smiled and reached forward for her hand. Her headache subsided as excitement began to build in her chest. Could it be that she and Ben were on the same wavelength after all? Maybe, despite what she'd done, it could all work out. Oh, she said. Yes, and look, he said, placing his tea on the bedside table and taking her hand in both of his. His eyes were excited in a way she hadn't seen for years. I have a suggestion. Yes, she asked, her voice barely more than a whisper. It's about France, he said. Oh, Ben, because, look, I know how much you want to go. I do, I really do. So let's do it. What? Are you serious? She flung her arms around him, only just keeping her tea balanced in its mug, and nestled her head onto his shoulder, her heart hammering with a kind of surreal excitement. This wasn't really happening, was it? Wait, you haven't heard the best bit, he said, drawing back and smiling confidently. I saw an offer in the Express last week. A weekend in Paris? First-class Eurostar, three-star hotel, just £199 per person if you collect all the tokens. It's our anniversary coming up, isn't it? And what a bargain! Oh, France, here we come, he said, his eyes searching her face for the reciprocal excitement he seemed sure he was going to find. Um, yes... It was as if he'd taken the helium out of her balloon of happiness and filled it instead with shit. It plummeted messily to the ground. But right now, she reminded herself, the disappointment was the least of her concerns. OK, she said, trying to smile as her brain raced at a hundred miles an hour. She'd email eBay and say she'd made a mistake. Maybe say she had a toddler who'd clicked the button by accident, See if there was any legal wriggle room. See how committed she actually was. She wasn't giving up on France, but this was definitely not the way she'd wanted to do it. Because the email she'd opened just now hadn't been confirmation of a break, a receipt for money paid, or information from a letting agent. Instead, it had read, Congratulations, you placed the winning bid for Stone Cottage with 3,000 square metre garden and outbuilding for renovation. She'd scrolled down, only half understanding, then stopped when she'd seen the text at the bottom. You have committed to buying this property for the sum of €48,601. Please contact the seller to complete the transaction. She'd only gone and bought a bloody house. Chapter 4 So, what's the emergency? Emily said as Lily opened the door. She was dressed in what looked like pyjama bottoms, which protruded from underneath a long coat. Her wavy brown hair was piled on top of her head in a messy bun. I came as soon as I got your message. I can see that, Lily said, tucking her own sandy blonde hair behind her ear and feeling rather guilty that she was showered and freshly washed. I'm sorry if I made it seem, well, that urgent. Christ's sakes, Lily! I thought I was going to have to rescue you from burglars or, I don't know, put out a house fire. You said your message. I thought you were crying. But you seem fine. Emily said, stepping into the hall with an eye roll. I've calmed down. So, nothing's on fire? Nothing's on fire. And I could have taken ten minutes to get dressed? You could have taken an hour. Sorry. I should have been a bit clearer on the phone. Lily grimaced apologetically. So what on earth is this emergency? And what exactly do you need rescuing from? Emily said, giving her a quick peck on the cheek. I thought I was meant to be the dramatic one. Shh, keep your voice down, Lily said, glancing furtively over her shoulder. Why the shushing? I thought you said Ben was out. Yes, he's out. It's just Ty still here. Asleep, I think, but you never know. And I'm just not... I don't want anyone to know about this yet. Now I am intrigued. What on earth have you done, Lily Butterworth? Surely it can't be that bad, Emily said, slipping off her coat, throwing it over the banisters.
and revealing that she had indeed come out in checkered pyjama bottoms and a creased T-shirt that read, Sweet dreams, sweetie pie. Lily grinned. Nice outfit, she said. She placed a quick hand on her friend's shoulder. But thank you, she added. I mean, you seriously came through for me. You mean I overdid it, as usual? Well, maybe, but it was my fault. They smiled at each other for a moment. Then Emily shook her head. You only get to cry wolf a couple of times, you know, before people don't bother to turn up any more, she said. I know. One more fake emergency and that'll be it. Wolves everywhere. No sheep left to be found. Oh, there's still an emergency, Lily said, making a face. Just not a the call is coming from inside the house type of emergency. More of a, a well, I suppose you could call it a situation. A situation? Emily said, ears suddenly pricked. Tell me more. Try not to sound too enthusiastic about it. Ooh, have you done something bad, Lily? It depends how you define bad, I suppose, she said, walking through into the living room where her laptop flickered on the sofa. She passed it to Emily silently and watched as her friend's eyes quickly scanned the text of the email. Bloody hell, Lily. Is this for real? Emily sank onto the sofa, her humour draining from her briefly. Yep, Lily replied, sitting next to her. Told you it was a situation. This is almost dashing over in pyjamas worthy. I know. How much wine did you actually have? Well, almost a bottle, but that's not the point. You know, most people get involved in a bit of harmless antisocial behaviour when they're on the lash. Maybe get arrested or something, or sleep with a stranger, or I don't know... Have a screaming row and throw their partner's stuff out on the lawn? Her friend told her, amusement turning up the corners of her mouth despite her serious expression. Yep, all preferable to this, I'd say. Certainly cheaper, yep. And who looks at properties on eBay anyway? Whenever I buy something on there, I forget to check the measurements and it ends up a complete disaster. But a house? I know. One you haven't even seen? I know. In France? Shh, I know, Lily said. What I don't know is what on earth I'm going to do about it. Seeing Emily had cheered her up, as it usually did, but the anxiety she'd been flooded with this morning raced through her again as she looked at the text on the screen. For once, it had been a relief that Ben had booked up a game of tennis for Saturday morning. Usually she'd be disappointed they couldn't spend a lazy morning together. But today... She'd practically packed his sports bag for him. You sure it's OK? He'd said. Sorry, I forgot to put it on the calendar. I mean, I don't feel that great, so if you want me to change it... No, don't be silly. It'll do you good, she'd said, patting his back and ushering him to the front door. Oh, look, here are your keys. I'll be half an hour early at this point. Bye then, she trilled, shutting the front door before rushing to the phone to ring Emily. Surely it's not binding. I mean clicking a button on eBay, Emily said now. You could say your kid did it, or your dog or something. It must happen all the time. That's what I hoped. I was going to get onto eBay and find out this morning, but then I got a message from the seller, an email. And? Well, it was all in French, so I had to run it through Google Translate, but... She reached over and flicked up another web page. Translation. Dear Mrs... I am delighted very that you have purchased the good-looking house of stone near to a large body of water. I will speak to the lawyer, and the paperwork he will become drawn up in very shortly time, I truly believe, very not slowly. And it is good news for you too. I am the mayor of the local town of Imoutier, that which means I can make quicker the time for signing. There is still, of course, a legal process but one that I can influence with my powers and help to make a more quickly speed. I wish to hear from you most quickly. Many wonderful days, Frédéric de Breton. It wasn't the most accurate of translations, but it was pretty easy to get the gist. Oh, yes. He's the mayor. Yep. And I looked him up. Did you know that in France the mayor is also the chief gendarme? The what? Head of the local police? Whoops. Uh-oh, you're in trouble, Lily Butterworth, Emily said with a laugh. I know, I mean, 
I'm not sure how I stand legally as far as eBay is concerned, but there's all this momentum from this Frederic guy now, too. And it feels so official, and I'm just worried that if I back out, I might be in trouble. Emily slung an arm around her friend's shoulder and shook her head. Darling, I was joking. I don't think he's going to extradite you to France and haul you before the courts or throw you in the dungeon of his chateau. I know that. But I want to move to France one day. You may have mentioned this previously. Em, it's not funny. What if I muck this guy around and end up scuppering my whole future? Lily felt her mouth wobble with threatened tears. You seriously think said Emily, looking at her, that making a mistake on one transaction might blacklist you for the whole of France? Lily felt herself blush. I know, it's extreme. But it feels serious. I mean, of all the houses on eBay, why did I have to commit to buy one from the fucking chief of police? And you know what I'm like with, well, getting things right? You mean your misplaced sense of honour? I mean, wanting to do the right thing. That's what I said. So I'm screwed, basically, aren't I? Emily looked at her and put a reassuring hand on her knee. Her brow was slightly furrowed, and she focused her intelligent green eyes on Lily's face. He's not the Inspector General's sweetheart, he's just the local Bobby at best. I mean, how many houses are there in A. Moutier? I don't know, maybe a thousand? And the hamlet the house is in? Probably about a hundred at most. And by the looks of this one, half of them are derelict or for sale. So he's not the big I am or anything. No, I suppose not. Still, I feel I know you do, Emily said kindly. That's one of the things I love about you. My chronic anxiety, your honesty. Thank you. So what are you going to do? Emily said. Do you want me to help you? I can't remember much French from school, but I'm sure I could help you wriggle out of it. I can say I did it, if you want. Lily looked at Emily, her face earnest. You're such a good friend, she said. So that's a yes? You want me to contact this Frédéric? Emily said with a mock French accent. No, said Lily slowly, looking at her friend. I don't think I do. You're not actually going to go through with it, are you? I mean, I know you want to move to France and all.